Hi, my name is Chris Fowler, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been here and been blessed. Thank you and God bless. All right. You know what a jump scare is? A jump scare is the term they use when you are expecting to be scared and yet you jump anyway. So I don't know if you've ever been watching a really suspenseful movie, right? And you know exactly that there is a villain around the corner. And you know that as soon as you get to this particular spot, the villain is going to appear. And sometimes, whether they jump out at you or don't jump out at you, you still will jump when you see the villain. And yet we keep watching those sorts of movies anyway. Some people seem to really enjoy this response, and some people do not. And I think it all comes back to whether your parents purchased you a specific type of child's toy. The ones I'm most familiar make a little, a little tune. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> Pop goes the weasel. Now I'm not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with those creepy creatures that pop out. And trust me, there's a whole variety of them where you can get curious George the monkey or, or any cartoon character practically to jump out at you. But why do we think this is a great idea for our children? <laughs> do this until it scares you to death. I know that there's a game too where you have a timer and, and, and you got to put the pieces in before the timer breaks in the piano. Yeah, can't remember the name of it and I didn't look it up. I think operation's the one where you have to be real steady. But what about a roller coaster? You're standing on the ground, you see the roller coaster and what it's about to do, and you make your decision whether or not you're going to get on. So if you see that it loops upside down and sideways three times, you get on knowing that it's going to loop upside down and sideways three times. And what happens when you get to the first loop? You wonder if you're going to survive, right? The way I've always tried to explain it to my children is it's perfectly safe to get on. They want your money. They know that the big money is when you're spending stuff inside the park, which means they need you to come back. So if they kill you on the first roller coaster you get on, it's not financially stable. <laughs> but we like to sometimes get scared or scare ourselves. We, we make ourselves do it. But scientists have studied this particular thing, and one of the things they've discovered is that if you are aware that you're about to be frightened, it actually makes the jump reflex even stronger. Which means that if they just have the, the person jump out at you, then you're going to maybe get scared. But if you know it's coming, that it'll actually be even stronger and faster than if it was just sudden. Isn't that great news for you today? I knew that's what you came here to learn. And well, now you don't go to sleep because I said not to. But that's the whole thing, right? One, subject, one scientist reported that when his subjects were made anxious before they scared them, that their response was 100 to 300 percent stronger than other times. And, and by the way, post-traumatic stress, that's what it is. It's this heightened anxiety so that anything causes issues. So sometimes we know that something is coming. Sometimes we are aware of what might be about to come down the pike, and yet we still have trouble facing it. My question is this, how does Jesus model or <laughs> Jesus models how Christ followers should handle anxiety and burdens from God. How, how should we do that? 
Last week we talked a little bit about the response to Jesus' explanations to his disciples that that he's going to go through suffering and that he's going to go through death. And one of the things that we said was that they really, we really need to kind of align ourselves with God intentions, right? Like we, we have our own desires. And, and then we have this whole idea where Peter really was kind of telling Jesus, you know, don't say this. Don't, you know, don't let this happen. We're, we're out. We've got your back. And so in some ways, what we're going to talk about today kind of picks up where that left off. And there's, there's kind of a lot of different things that I would have loved to have talked about this morning. But I gave myself one sermon on this topic. And when I was really done with about three hours worth of information to share with you and really challenge you today, I realized that you probably would fall asleep by the end of the three hours. And for a sermon called Stay Awake, that's not a good plan. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you're going to have to be careful because I'm going to preach three sermons in one sermon's time. So listen fast, here we go. Our next step, our next stop on our journey towards the cross comes from a familiar Easter story. It's, it's the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you've been in the church a long time, you've heard this. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called, called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for just one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found them again sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more, prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Oh. Jesus has found his way through his life to the darkest and most desolate, alone place in the journey of his human life. I want you to really get the weight of this. Because too often, I, I, I think we don't read this with the proper sort of thinking that, that's absolutely necessary. He knows that this is the night that he's going to be, be, be betrayed. He knows that this is the night that he is going to suffer, not just with people saying things to him, but he's going to be beaten. He's going to be bloodied. He's going to, to be in, in a great deal of pain. He knows that this is the night that, that he is going to give his life. There's a lot of things that, that give us some fulfillment in life that, that really build into us. But one thing that none of us really enjoys is the moments when we are at our darkest. We don't say, Lord, everything is going great. Could you make things worse for a while? Instead, we gen generally do other things. There are some things that do cause us to call into a, a place of deep despair or anxiety. Certain medical diagnoses, certain things that happen around us, certain circumstances in the world might make us feel like we're in the depths of despair. But what would you be feeling if you knew the next things, the very next steps you're going to take in life are going to be an injustice against you that are going to be suffering, and that ultimately will lead to your death. This is not going to be a light moment for Jesus. 
I want to be careful here because sometimes we get caught up in Jesus was God, so much so that we forget that Jesus was also very fully human. And one of my biggest challenges, and I really wish that someday, and I guess someday I'll finally figure this out, but that that there would be like a, uh, just, I don't know, a, a, a little primer as to what Jesus was like as a kid. So if you figure the whole gamut of human life, even though the Bible doesn't really tell us, I'm guessing that at some point Jesus was playing, he fell, and he scraped his knee. And did Mary pick him up and kiss it, make it better? Was he ever running and hit his head on the coffee table? Was he ever riding his bike and fell over? I wonder, not that this would have ever happened to any of us, but did he ever get through the entire day, get home, take off his socks and realize that they were not a perfect pair? Or get halfway through the day and realize that his left sandal was on his right foot and his right sandal was on his left. I'm kind of curious. How did Jesus respond when he hit his funny bone for the first time? Did Jesus ever know the embarrassment of walking around with his fly open? or reaching over to pick something up and splitting the seam of his pants. I'm pretty sure that Jesus had to have had the hiccups at least once in his life. And I guess for all we know, he might have snored really loudly when he slept. And perhaps when something was really funny to him, he snorted as he laughed. I've thought about this a little bit. We know that Jesus took breaks. It's talked about a lot. Sometimes he went off to be all by himself. Sometimes he went off to pray and talk to the Father. And sometimes he just needed to get away. We know that he ate with people because, goodness, he ate with sinners one time. And, and he, his, his disciples didn't quite follow all the rules once and, and all of those things. But do you ever notice that the Bible never refers to Jesus really needed to use the restroom? So he excused himself. But he was just as human as you and I. Could you imagine being pressed in on all sides and you're really looking for the bathroom and you're like, hey, I need a personal minute. But those don't take place in the scripture. What we do know is on this particular day, Jesus, from a very human perspective, from the very same emotions that you and I share, was in the depths of despair. He was extremely overwhelmed by what he was about to face, knowing that this is the next step in his ministry and in God's story of saving the world. So he's got his entire 12 disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Apparently, all of them were there. Gethsemane, by the way, means oil press. It's an oil or an olive tree grove, and, and there's a lot of space there toward the, the, the base of the Mount of Olives. The, the Garden of Gethsemane is still there today. Jesus gathers his closest friends from that group, and he asks them to keep watch with him. Now, the scripture tells us that Jesus pulls aside Peter. He pulls aside the two sons of Zebedee, which happen to be James and John. So it's Peter, James, and John who go a little bit further. The the rest of the 12 are kind of left behind. Peter, James, and John are there. And Jesus says, look, I am having an issue here, and I want you especially to keep watch and to pray. Now, my guess is that the rest of the disciples were allowed to go to sleep. That's the one that needed to keep watch, that Jesus wanted them to to kind of be uh, with him. Those are the ones that he kind of pulls away. And he, he says, almost like in a change of tone, right, that he is sorrowful, he's troubled. He uses these words, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is Jesus speaking to his closest friends friends 
who see directly that he is really down and in despair. That he's anxious, that he's worried, that he's struggling. And Jesus tells them, my soul is so struggling right now, I could die. It's not worth living. It's not worth it. Uh, This is Jesus speaking. And I think sometimes we kind of read over that and go, well, he's God. He, He can speak to anybody he wants. He can talk to them. And of course, he can handle it. And I want to tell you something because this is important for us to truly understand the story that we're reading today. You and I, in the midst of despair, in the midst of need, we truly need the presence of other close friends and Christians, brothers and sisters. We need them in our life at the time of need. And there's some questions that you and I face. There's some issues that you and I might be facing that there is no one on this planet who can help us understand. And one of those questions that we have not yet gotten an answer to is what is it like to die? What does it feel like to go and experience death? You and I cannot explain that to any other person. And there's no one around who's died and come back and said, well, let me tell you all about it. Uh, I'm still in the grave, but here's the, you know, no ghost even can come tell you what it's like to die. And my guess is that Jesus, who's about to experience this, is struggling for this very same reason. What is it like to die? I also would tell you this. I'm convinced that one of our biggest fears as humanity is that God is going to abandon us. Now, normally it's us abandoning God, but we have this fear, no matter how many times that God has come to us and come through for us, I think that we're always worried that when things really get bad, God is going to just disappear. And leave us alone. So Jesus, being God's son, being fully divine and fully human, on the human side, has to be feeling a couple of things, right? What is death going to be like? And what if the Father doesn't do what I expect that he's going to do? What happens if he abandons me? If Jesus is really human, he would be experiencing the same sorts of questions as we would, right? Right? You ever done one of those trust exercises? You know, lean back and I'll catch you. Could you imagine doing that with your life? You see, this is why Jesus is in the midst of despair. He doesn't know what he's about to go through. He doesn't know what's going to happen here. He doesn't know what what God the Father is going to do next. So Jesus goes on a little further. He leaves the three behind to pray and and asks them to keep watch. And and he goes further where he absolutely prostrates himself down. He falls on the face and and straight down and, and begins to pray, I'm sure, in some of the most deep and meaningful prayer that God has ever heard. And he says, Lord, let this cup pass. Give me a pardon. This is what he's doing. He's asking for a pardon, and yet also he's saying, let me know what your will is, because that's really what's important here. That no matter what I'm going to be facing, you are the one who matters. Now I want to point something out, because it says, let this cup pass from me. Now, we know the cup to be symbolic in part because of the, the Last Supper, right? We, we would have that image. The minute this, let this cup pass from me, we would begin to, to think of that. But in Old Testament terms, one of the things that the cup stood for was really the cup of God's wrath. What he's really saying is all of God's wrath, to a certain extent, is now going to be on him. As he begins to pay the price for all of our sin, and he goes through death in order to allow this to occur. But I don't know if you've ever been asked to do something you don't really want to do. The first thing we do when somebody asks us to do something we're not comfortable with is ask them not to let us do it or have us do it. 
can you do this, you know, give this to somebody else, have somebody else do this. And this is where Jesus finds himself. While Jesus is in anguish, his close friends, keeping watch, had failed to help him. They're supposed to be keeping watch. They're supposed to be praying to the Lord. They know that Jesus is in sorrow to the point of death. They have plenty to pray about. And he comes back, and they're asleep. Now, to be fair, the Scripture doesn't really tell us how they'd fallen asleep. Did they make some beds out of the the leaves or something and and lay down and pull the covers over and, and just kind of dream off to sleep? Or were they kind of leaning up against a tree, you know, kind of sitting there, leaned up against the tree, and, and Jesus comes over, and really, they're sitting there still, but their mouths are gaping open, and the drool is falling out. Doesn't get that clear with us, but what really comes out is that Jesus says, listen, I had asked you, my closest friends, to be with me, and you cannot stay awake for even a very short period of time on one of the most difficult nights of my life. You see, the problem is they don't seem to be appropriately troubled. Now, I got to tell you that reading this as an outsider, I, I, I think I can really relate to Peter, James, and John, who, you know, Jesus kept them, I think, on a pretty hectic schedule of healing people and teaching people and, and learning, and, and he would do things that really challenged their thinking. And, and I don't know if you've ever really been challenged in your thinking, but that sometimes takes more work and energy from us than if we went out and, and built a railroad. Because our minds really require a lot to process. But he doesn't say, the scripture doesn't say that he's angry, but I, I kind of read into his question to Peter. He's like, couldn't you men watch with me for just an hour? But I don't really read that that way. Every time I've read this, I've never read it that way. It's always been, Really? I asked for an hour and you can't even stay awake that long? Now again, that's me reading into it. But, uh, but the reality is, I think Jesus would have every right to be upset. Jesus warns them to continue their watch and to continue to pray so that they're not going to be tempted. Wait, what are they tempted about? To fall asleep again? I don't think that that's what this warning is all about. I think the issue is that they have already said that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Now you have Jesus. He's told them what's going to happen. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. And by the way, this night, he's at the depths of his his despair, and he's very sorrowful. He's very troubled. He's super anxious. He knows that bad things are about to happen. And he says, look, would you pay close attention with me? And he comes back and finds them not caring at all. They're sleeping. This isn't just a normal sermon. This is them supposed to be praying and paying close attention. What he's really trying to tell them about this idea of temptation is that if you don't pray now, that the Lord's will will be done and be resolved to do God's intentions, not your intentions, guess what's going to happen next? Because when I'm hanging on the cross, what's going to happen to you? Because he's Jesus and he knows he's tempted to not go through with it. So what's going to happen when we get there? There's going to be fear. They're going to be afraid of their own deaths. They're going to be afraid of their own futures, of their own suffering. They need to pray. They need to keep watch so that they will be prepared for what's coming next just as much as Jesus will be. And by the way, I think Jesus is speaking to us here as well. There's this phrase in there. Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And and a lot of times when we read through this, one of the biggest challenges that we face is that we are looking at a situation of absolutely thinking that there's the body and there's the soul, kind of duality sort of thing, as opposed to we are one being. This is not how Jesus and the people of his time would have seen that. They would not have been thinking, oh, well, you know, 
My heart's in the right place. It's just that my body has a hard time doing what my heart wants to do. In fact, the possibility that most scholars will tell you is that the idea here of spirit is the bit of God that's already in us and that God wants to to kind of deepen in. Think a little bit like the Holy Spirit. It allows us to, to really be in that deep relationship with God and allows us to serve him and do what he would like us to do. And so that's part of the issue. That's part of the challenge. The flesh is clearly the things of this world. Things like human nature, it tends to want to, for us, we, we do this constantly. We want to be like God rather than to be one of God's servants. This is the challenge. This is what gets us into the most trouble. This is the, the challenge that we face day in and day out, is that we want to be like God. So what he's really telling Peter and the others listening is that the issue that you are facing here is that you are still double-minded. You're still here on the earth instead of being more heavenly-minded and being in more relationship with God. So by the end of this event, we find ourselves in a strange place. Jesus has asked his companions to stay awake three times, and three times they have failed him. Natalie, could you go sit in the back for a while with mom? Thank you. Three times this has occurred. He says, watch and pray, and they fall asleep. He says, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation, and they still fall asleep. In fact, it says that that their eyes were heavy, that they were so exhausted they couldn't keep going. He comes back again, and, and Matthew doesn't even bother to tell us if he says anything specific to them. He says he came out, found them sleeping, and went back a third time. The implication, of course, is that he said, guys, wake up. Wake up. It's time. And each time they fall asleep. Each time. It is a bit of a difficult passage because I'm sitting here going, I would like to say that if Jesus had asked me to do this and I saw that he was in the depths of despair, that I would have done things differently. (laughs) But there's one thing that's really clear from the passage. Jesus goes in hoping that God will change his mind and allow this cup to pass from him, but comes out absolutely resolved for what's going to happen next. You see, immediately the discussion of of sadness and anxiety is over. Jesus basically says, all right, I'm ready to go meet my accuser. Let's do the next thing. Let's make the next thing happen. And that's what he's really saying. What we see as we were looking forward to what's going to happen with Jesus on the cross is that the disciples, particularly the three that Jesus most desperately wanted to be ready, are not. Three times they fall asleep. Three times Peter denies Jesus. You see, we kind of get this foretaste. How does Jesus model for us how Christ's followers should handle anxiety and burdens from God? Well, I want to tell you a couple of things. First off, Christ followers, us, we, should gather together when faced with anxiety and burdens. And now let me take this a step further. Now congratulations, you're in church this morning. When are you without anxiety and burdens? You you see, one of the things that I've noticed is that no matter how much you pray that your anxieties and your burdens will go away, they don't. What changes isn't the circumstances around you. What changes and makes those things better is that when God transforms you and you realize that you are no longer alone. Why? Because we have gathered. So there's about 90 of your closest friends sitting here in this room today. 
people who want to support you, who want to uplift you in your time of need. And out of those, hopefully you have two or three or more that you can gather together in a sense who can pray with you. And by the way, we live in a time that's way better than Jesus because we live in a time where there's phones, there's cars, there's whatever else that you could call some friends and they could be over at your house in minutes. And helping meet your need. You see, I know that there are some people who have this incredible gift that as soon as they even recognize that somebody is in trouble, they have anxiety or they have burdens that are, that are weighing extra deep on them, that they have the ability to come into their lives and simply to be present. It's not even about anything that they say. It's not anything about anything they do. It's just that their very presence is a calming force because we like to know we're not alone. Sometimes I do worry that we are so far concerned, by the way, with physical things that we forget that we also need to have some burdens and some anxieties that revolve around spiritual things. You see, one of my problems is that I think in the church we have made it almost taboo to come up to the altar because, oh, something must be really wrong in their life. (coughs) Got to go do some business with God. Oh, wonder what's going on there. Instead of saying, how are things between you and God? We don't ask each other that question enough. I encourage you to ask that question. Are things really good between you and God, or are you just coming into church and smiling? i got to tell you that one of the things that really struggles, that causes me to struggle, is when people are always just just smiling. Everything's good. I want to be part of their life until I suddenly realize that their whole life is falling around, uh, falling around about them. And instead of coming in and going, oh, you would not believe the week I've had. It's so good to be here today, to be among my friends, to be able to gather together when I'm faced with my anxieties and my concerns. And by the way, what I'm trying to tell you is you don't have to wait until the next Sunday. There's people that you can call. There's people you can come into. Have you heard about journey groups? Not a lot of people want to be a part of them, but they would be a great opportunity to gather together and to be a part of it. But I really got to ask you this question. Jesus is faced with a calling from God that, by the way, is harder than any calling that God has ever given any of us. He says, I want you to take on the sin of all humanity and and die. Overcome death, defeat Satan. That's his calling. God sometimes calls you and says, hey, I uh, want you to help with the Easter extravaganza. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to play a game with a bunch of kids that you don't know. You're going to smile at them. You don't have to tell them that Jesus loves them, but you can. And you ought to show it. We're going to hide a bunch of eggs out on the field. And we're like, oh, the depths of despair. (laughs) Children, ah! You want me to spend an hour and a half or two hours doing something on a Saturday morning? That's the only day I get to myself. Come on, Lord, what? How about 30 minutes on a Thursday at noon? (laughs) And I'm wondering how many people have had God call you to something so serious that you found yourself either in an altar like this or laying flat on the floor wherever you happen to be in total anguish, which, by the way, laying flat on the floor, kneeling at an altar, is a position of surrender, saying, Lord, I no longer need to be in control of this. But you are. That's what Jesus was doing from a human perspective when he just basically falls to his face on on the ground and says, Lord, please take this cup from me, but, but if this is your will, I'll do it. Could you find any other way? But if not, I'll do it. And then we find ourselves sitting back and going, well, that sounds great, Lord. You need somebody to be at this particular event or do this particular thing. (laughs) 
And here's the second thing I want to tell you. Christ followers should prepare for the expected by seeking God's will for every situation. Here's the good news. Jesus gave us a warning about what was to come. And it was all unicorns and rainbows, remember? If you'll just follow him, you'll never have problems with money or with relationships or with anything because he is just going to make sure everything is absolutely perfect. You will go out and you might even win the lottery if you'll just buy a ticket. He says nothing like that. In fact, he says, guess what? This is going to be awesome. You, because you follow me, you're going to, have, you're going to be faced with some suffering. Isn't that cool? It's the worst sales pitch ever, right? Come follow me, it's going to be really hard. I'm going to mess with your life. I'm going to call you to do things you don't want to do. After I do that, I'm going to make you like it. You know how you do that? You stop. You pray. And your will becomes God's will, or God's will becomes your will, however you want to look at it. Those two things become aligned. And by the way, every single time that I've argued with God and tried to have him see it my way, I've lost. And every single time, his way was better than what I was thinking. When you are in the midst of trials and temptations, do you stop? Do you pray? Do you prostrate yourself? Do you come up to the altar? Do you, do you have an altar that you go to? Is there a place where you and God become great friends? What do you do? Who do you bring near you when you need support? You see, I love when they get to the point where I think it's the second time Jesus comes back and they were, they were asleep because their eyes were heavy. We've all had heavy eyes. You've experienced this. Some of you in church. You come to church, you're supposed to watch and pray. But if you're super exhausted when you get here, Sometimes that's hard. I noticed that Jesus never excuses that they fell asleep. It says that they were sleeping because their eyes were heavy. That would maybe be a justification or a really good excuse, but he doesn't say that that's okay. And as I've thought about this, I thought about the fact that really what happens to those poor disciples is they've missed an opportunity to align their will and to prepare themselves for what is coming next. Jesus had told them. They didn't understand it, but he had told them. He then says, look, would you come with me? Would you be a part of what we're doing? And, and they totally missed the chance to not just sit and pray and say, Lord, be with Jesus because something is going on here and he's been talking like a crazy person who's going to be suffered and put to death and that we're going to have to pick up our cross and follow him. And what on earth does that mean for me and for, for, for the guys around me? And, and Lord, how, do we, how, how can you help make this all better? And in the meantime, will you be with us? Will you guide us? Will you show us what to do? And guess what? They're sleeping. So they're not ready. They should have prayed. But they slept. They know what's coming. Not the details, but the generalities but they're not getting themselves ready. My fear for us is that we're in the same exact position. Jesus has called us to a life that's better than the one we're living, that that he showed us that there's going to be some struggles on the way to this life that he's, he's, he's offering. 
But he says, look, you need to pray. You've got to pray your will out of you and sink in, you know, let it just come in all of God's desires for your life and all God's needs for your life. And instead, we're like, okay, Lord, let me pray. Lord, let this life that you've promised me, you know, show me the way. Uh, Amen. Or some people, Lord. I don't want to be that person. If God is calling me to something better, to something greater, to really reach people for his sake. I don't want to be caught asleep. Amen. So, are you staying awake? So far. Hmm. <laughs> Heavenly Father, this is a rough one from so many different perspectives for me. Because there's so many great things that are part of this passage and, and so many truths that, that you want us to see. But the reality is, is that too often we fail to gather together when we should. We fail to stay awake and pray when we ought to be. We fail to recognize that in the midst of this despair and everything else, that it hasn't just totally gone away, but that you, Lord, are continuously calling us to bring others to know you. You're constantly continuing to call us to become closer to you, and you're constantly looking for people who are willing to be your hands, willing to be your feet, and willing to just do whatever you ask. And what we let get into the way is our desire to be God over our own lives. Lord, we know what's coming. We can look around and we can see that you have, you have a lot of things that go on in your world that you need us to be your hands and feet here for. Forgive us of the times that we're not good representatives of who you are. And help us to truly pray and truly consider what you've called us to do. Lord, I just have a sense that as I'm speaking, there's somebody who's, who's listening to my voice. Who's saying, spiritually today, I, I feel like I'm being challenged to go further than I've ever gone before. That maybe in some respect, I'm kind of asleep. Lord, if there's someone who feels like they need to spend some time with you, I'd ask that you would just pick them up and move them to these altars. That you would give them the strength to stand up and to come down and spend some time with you. Lord, I invite them to come down at any time, even during the last song, Lord. Because now is the time for us not to fall asleep at the switch, not to not to just simply kind of let our lives be on autopilot spiritually, but to truly listen to what you have to say to us and to truly understand that we are to gather, we're to keep watch, and we're to pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you glory for what you're doing in each life today. In Jesus' name we pray. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the little bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in the person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.